Welcome to the latest installment of the AST AJT Journal Club series. Today's Journal Club is hosted by the AST Community of Transplant Scientists. Our speaker today is Dr. Megan Levings from the University of British Columbia, and our moderator is Dr. Olivia Martinez from Stanford University. We're also joined by authors, Dr. Nicholas Dawson and Dr. Isaac Rosado Sanchez for our Q&A session at the end. Before we begin the main presentation, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's session. There is currently a viewership polling question displayed for the audience. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcements. This journal club is being recorded and the archive will be available on the MyAST website within 24 to 48 hours after the session. Please note that your lines have all been muted so that only the presenters can be heard for the archive recording. If you have a question for our panelists during the journal club, we encourage you to participate by using the questions tab in the GoToWebinar panel to submit your questions for consideration. If there are questions we do not have time for, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question with the answer on the website following the journal club. Finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's journal club, you will see a short survey to complete. Please fill out the survey to help us keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to our moderator, Dr. Olivia Martinez, to begin our presentation. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I want to welcome everybody and thank you all for joining us today for the AST AJT Journal Club hosted by COTS. We're delighted to have Megan Levings of the University of British Columbia with us today. Dr. Levings and her group have been leaders in the development and application of T-regulatory cells in transplantation, and today she and her co-authors, Dr. Dawson and Dr. Rosado Sanchez, are here to discuss their recent publication in Science Translational Medicine on the impact of various co-stimulatory molecule domains on T-reg, CAR T-regs um, in, the, in the function of these cells in transplant models, and a GVHD in particular. So as Brian stated earlier, please feel free to submit questions to the speaker during the presentation in the chat. We'll have plenty of time at the end of the presentation to have uh, Dr. Levings and her co-authors respond to those questions. With that, uh, let's get started. Dr. Levings. Great. Thanks so much, Olivia, for the introduction and for the opportunity for us to share the paper with you today, I was thinking about it this morning, and I'm so happy get to get a chance to do this for, for two reasons. One is, usually when I give talks, there's never enough time to really go in depth into the work, and so I end up kind of skimming it over, skimming over, so it's nice to have a chance to kind of really show all the data. And secondly, this paper was um, a long-term saga in the lab, and I have to say, when it finally got published in August, we, you know, we had that feeling of never wanting to see the paper again. Um, and it was really great over the weekend to have a chance to go back and look through it and really, you know, remind ourselves that it was a, a really significant body of work. So uh, with that said, I also want to point out that this work uh, does have a conflict of interest because it was partially funded by TXL, a French company, which is now owned by Sangamo. Um, and I have other conflicts, but they're not related to this. So I'm going to go really quickly into the back, uh, just three background slides and then dive right into the paper. So uh, my lab for the last uh, few years has been working on how to change the specificity of Tregs towards alloantigens. And we uh, decided to first tackle this question by making a chimeric antigen receptor specific for HLA-A2. Um, we were essentially just uh, following the rule book of the people from cancer immunology, making a quite classic second generation chimeric antigen receptor with a single chain monoclonal antibody on the outside, a CD8 hinge, um, CD28 transmembrane and signaling domains, and a CD3 beta domain. And our overall idea was that because Tregs, in order to suppress immune responses, need to be activated by an antigen receptor, and need to be at the site of where the antigen is so they can suppress immune responses in a local environment. Our hope was that if we express this chimeric antigen receptor on Tregs, that it would of course activate them when they were in the presence of the antigen um, and also potentially make them most potent at the local site of the organ. Um, and um, for any of you following the general Treg field, you may know that uh, when you're doing polyclonal Treg therapy, you have to infuse a pretty high number of cells, which has been a bit of a barrier uh, in terms of just manufacturing. So the hope was that if we had antigen specific cells, we'd need fewer cells and that those cells on a per cell basis would have a more potent effect. 
And of course, if we were infusing fewer cells, we um, would have a less, a lower risk of non-specific suppression. So the way we make CAR T regs in the lab is we usually start with a, a naive population of cells. As long as we're using the A2 CAR, we have to use HLA A2 negative donors. So they're sorted first as being CD45 RA positive cells and then CD25 high, CD127 low cells. Um, transduce them with a lentivirus encoding the CAR of interest. We usually use the truncated nerve growth factor receptor as our transduction marker. So around half the cells are transduced then we can purify them into a nice pure population of cells. And then after 14 days, we can do all of our in vitro and in vivo assays. And I'm just gonna show this one slide, which really, um, I think it was the, the slide that really um, enabled this work to go now into clinical testing, which is that if you take an immunodeficient mouse and you put a small piece of human A2 positive skin on it, and then you infuse the mouse with PBMCs that are allogeneic to the human skin in the presence or absence of Tregs that are either just control polyclonal Tregs or Tregs expressing the relevant chimeric antigen receptor, we could show that the A2CAR Tregs were better able than just the polyclonal Tregs to ameliorate skin allograft rejection. Uh, and this was um, quantified by looking at staining for the involucrin layer here, which is destroyed uh, in the rejected skin graft in the mice that just got PBMCs as well as you can see proliferating keratinocytes trying to heal the wound. Uh, polyclonal Tregs do have a bit of an effect, which is what we would expect. There's some improvement here, but the A2 CAR Tregs were just much more consistently able to ameliorate skin allograft rejection. And we could see that a significant reduction in KI67 expression, as well as a significant reduction in the histological scoring. So um, all of that background work was done with a classic second generation chimeric antigen receptor, as I mentioned. And when we first made our construct, which you know the cloning was done way back in something like 2015, we just chose CD28 because it seemed like the obvious choice. It was um, known to be highly functional in the context of cancer immunology. And there was a lot of evidence in the literature that CD28 was an important signaling molecule for Tregs. But through the years, especially from the cancer immunology field, it became evident that there were lots of other types of co-stimulatory molecules that could be beneficial, in particular 41BB, which is now in one of the clinically approved CD19 CAR T cell products. And so we thought it was important to try and figure out whether or not uh, CD28 was actually the right choice or not. Uh, and so just to orient you to our CAR, here is a few different domains you need to know about to follow the paper. So of course the single chain just remains the same in all the experiments. We use an extracellular MIC tag that, is, uh, that we use as a good marker for expression of the CAR on the cell surface. Uh, and then it's quite empirical, all the little bits and pieces and how you put these receptors together. But the domains that we're gonna be looking at are the transmembrane domain first, and then in much more detail, the co-receptor intracellular signaling domain. There's also a lot of fiddling around you can do with the, the hinge region and the linker region, but we didn't tackle that in this project. Uh, before I go any further, I just wanna introduce you to the two people who did most of the work. So they're on the line, but you can't see us. This is a fun photo of Nick and Isaac from our, our lab Christmas curling party last year, which was our last lab social event <laughs> before the pandemic. Uh, and so this was part of Nick's thesis work. And then Isaac, who's a new fellow in the lab, came on to finish off some of the experiments. Uh, and this was a pretty significant team effort with a lot of input from other people in the lab. And I've listed them all here. Okay. So uh, the first question we had was what transmembrane domain to match with which intracellular domain? So we had this list of intracellular domains that we were interested in testing that I've listed here. And we chose them for a variety of reasons. So we chose ICOS because we thought that might be a good way to get IL-10 production from Tregs. We chose uh, CTLA-4 and PD-1 because these are inhibitory receptors that we thought maybe would increase Treg suppressive function. Uh, and then we chose the TNF receptor family members because as I mentioned, 41BB has been shown to be very successfully used in the CD19 CAR T cell product. Um, and then these two other TNF receptors closely related to 41BB, we thought would be interesting to test. Um, and then the TNFR2, there was a lot of evidence from the mouse world that this was uh, potentially an important positive receptor for Tregs. So there'd been several 
um, reports of the fact that if you uh, stimulated Tregs through the TNFR2, you could increase survival and suppressive function. Um, but we didn't quite know what was the best transmembrane domain to pair up with these. So the first thing Nick did was actually made all of these receptors either with their um, so-called native transmembrane or with a CD8 transmembrane, which is the one, can I close this GoToWebinar panel because I'm having a hard time pointing here. Ugh. Sorry, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have to turn my laser pointer off. Because, Dr. Levin, uh, this is Brian Valeria yeah. with AST. Um, yeah. There should be a, an orange arrow on the GoToWebinar oh, panel. Oh, then I can get rid of the little thing. You can yep. Okay, good. Yeah, now I can see my slides. Um, and then I'll turn the pointer back on. Um, so the first thing that Nick did was he cloned all of these receptors, either with the CD8 transmembrane domain or the native transmembrane domain. And um, uh, surprisingly, it, it really didn't make a huge difference. The, the only thing we saw very clearly was that the GITR receptor did not like to be expressed with CD28 transmembrane domain. And so on the basis of that, Nick decided to just use the native transmembrane domain for all of the TNF receptor family members. The, these normally function, especially TNF normally functions as a trimeric protein. So we thought it was probably better to just use the native one. Uh, and then for all of the other ones, which were part of the CD28 family member, we decided to just use the CD28 transmembrane domain with the exception of ICOS, because although it wasn't significant, there was a trend to better expression with the native transmembrane for ICOS. So that was um, the set of receptors that we set off to test in more detail. Um, so the first thing we saw that uh, there was quite a bit of variation in how well these different receptors were expressed. And you can just see that really clearly visually. If you look, so this is the wild type CD28 that we started off with. You can see beautiful co-expression of the MIC tag being the CAR, as well as NGFR, which is the surface marker. And then uh, the 4 dB and, uh, and the TNF receptor um, having uh, more variable levels of expression. And that's all quantified over here but they basically were, were all expressed um, on the cell surface. So we felt confident to be able to go on and test all of these receptors. Uh, and so the, another little interesting backstory to this paper is that the data I'm gonna show you next in figure two uh, was actually the last experiment that we did. So we ended up turning the paper around completely in terms of the order with which the data were generated. So this is an experiment where we took an immunodeficient mouse and injected the mouse with HLA-A2 positive PBMCs. And then from our previous work, we knew that if we put in the CD28 wild type CAR T regs, that they would suppress the generation of PBMC or of uh, xenoGBHD mediated by these PBMCs. And so fortunately, we were able to reproduce that finding. This is the, the control experiments um, for this part of the data. So we also were able to test the Tregs in two different concentrations because we thought potentially we might see dose-dependent effects depending on the CARs, which in fact we did. So here's the way the, the assay works. So these are the mice that get PBMCs. They get xenoGVHD and don't survive very well. If we put in Tregs that express just the CD, a car with no co-stimulatory domain, so just the CD3 zeta, they don't have much of a protective effect. The polyclonal Tregs, so here in green, do have a bit of a protective effect at the one to two ratio, but when we go down to the one to four ratio, that effect is essentially gone. And then the CD28 wild type Tregs are significantly better able to extend the, um, the or to mitigate the development of xenoGVHD. So these are the data from testing the CARs from the CD28 family members. So we tested um, a version of CD28 that carried one point mutation in a domain that was thought to be important for PI3 kinase signaling. And because of some of my lab's previous work in that area, we thought this might be beneficial for Tregs. <clears throat> so you can see at the one to two ratio that uh, this wild type uh, the wild type and mutant CD28 were actually not significantly different from each other, but when you went down to the one to four PBMC ratio, you can clearly see that the wild type CD28 was significantly better than the CD28 mutant. And similarly for ICOS, so at the higher ratio, the ICOS car was a pretty good extended survival, but not at the lower ratio. Um, and in contrast, the CTLA4 um, CAR and the PD-1 CAR essentially uh, were not effective at all, even at the higher ratios of Tregs. Um, going on to the TNF receptor family member, 
uh, even at the higher ratio of CAR-T regs, none of the CARs containing the TNF receptor family members were able to significantly delay GVHD. And in fact, when we, uh, at some of the doses in particular, the TNFR2 CAR uh, actually made GVHD worse. So you see here, this is the PBMC alone line, and here's the TNFR CAR, the mice are dying faster. So this in particular was a really surprising result because based on the cancer immunology literature, we thought 4-1-BB was gonna be awesome, really good for the Tregs. Uh, and, and we also similarly thought the TNFR2 was also going to be really good. So the rest of the paper is trying to figure out why that is. Why is it that the CD28 wild type uh, car is the only one that's really able to um, have the effect that we want in the in vivo humanized mouse model? So, uh, one of the things we were interested in was um, how well the cells survive in the mice. So figure three is trying to track the Tregs to see if there's differences in survival or potentially the phenotype of the Tregs. Uh, and so we're looking here at the, the percentage or the absolute number of human CD45 uh, positive, um, CAR positive cells, because they're MYC positive, CD45 positive cells in the blood of these mice at day seven. And you can clearly see that the CD28 wild type CAR has a survival advantage. Uh, whereas at day seven, um, you can still detect most of the Tregs that were infused with, with some exceptions. Um, there, all the other groups are, have significantly lower number of Tregs. Um, when we go and look at the, um, the oh sorry that's this is the next slide is the one that has the the foxp3 helios so the top here is just the percent and the bottom is the absolute cell number in the blood and then the next slide when we go and look at the expression of our favorite treg markers foxp3 and helios um, we can also see that the absolute number of cells that are foxp3 positive is significantly higher in the cd28 wild type car compared to all the other ones so these data suggested that at least one of the reasons why the C28 car was so much better is that these cells are uh, able to survive longer and are, are in higher numbers in vivo, whereas the other cells by day seven are essentially barely detectable anymore. Uh, we also wondered how the different cars were influencing different Treg mechanisms of action. So for the Treg experts in the audience, you probably know Tregs have lots of different ways that they can suppress immune responses. Uh, we certainly did not look at all of them, but we selected a subset to look at by flow cytometry. So in particular, uh, GARP and LAP, which are um, players in the TGF beta pathway, CTLA-4 and CD39. Uh, CD39, we didn't really pull out any differences between all the different CARs. Um, CTLA-4 was a, a bit variable. We clearly saw that the PD-1 car had lower CTLA-4 compared to the other ones, but there were no really significant differences with CTLA-4. But in contrast, there were absolutely differences when it came to um, induction of GARP uh, or LAP expression, which is the inactive form of TGF-beta, suggesting that uh, at least for this series of cars, one of the reasons potentially why they didn't work that well was maybe inadequate uh, TGF-beta expression. But I just wanna note that um, this was not the case for the C28 mutant car because it was able to express TGF-beta just as well as the wild type car, yet this car also did not work in vivo and did not work as well in vivo. Um, because in, from the cancer world, there was evidence that different cars can change um, the state of T-cell activation and the state of exhaustion. In particular, with uh, the, in the CAR-T world, cars containing 4-1-BB being better able to prevent the development of T-cell exhaustion and promote a, a beneficial um, central memory phenotype. We were also interested in how the different cars affected uh, these phenotypes in our Tregs. So, this is um, a lot of data put into one of these lifesaver plots, but essentially if you just look uh, at the day seven data, these are the cells that have been stimulated uh, with the car for seven days. Uh, and you can see a few different interesting things. One is that the car that encodes PD-1 tends to really promote a naive cell phenotype with actually an increase in CD45 RA CCR7 positive cells. Whereas these two cars, the ones that actually made the Tregs uh, work less well in vivo, um, tended to promote more of a 
central memory um, effector memory type phenotype, which was quite distinct from the CD28 wild type car you see here, which really tends to promote just exclusively an effector memory cell phenotype. Uh, we were also interested in how the cars affect cytokine production. So I think I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we thought that potentially the ICOS car might be a good way to make these cells produce IL-10. Uh, and that turned out to not be the case. Uh, the best way to get IL-10 out of these cells is with the CD28 wild type or mutant cells. None of the cars uh, stimulated production of uh, IL-2 or TNF or IL-4. Um, the CD28 wild type uh, and mutant cars did stimulate um, some IL-6, some IL-17, and some interferon gamma, um, but these levels were always uh, significantly lower than would be stimulated by expressing a car in conventional T cells. However, I will note that if you compare that uh, to Tregs that were stimulated through the T cell receptor, the T cell receptor in terms of cytokine production in these cells is always completely zero, suggesting that the car is able to potentially have a slightly different cytokine profile than a T cell receptor stimulated Treg. Um, another reason why we thought the car uh, may not work would be effects on Treg stability. So there's some evidence mostly from the mouse world that Tregs can potentially lose FOXP3 expression and turn into effector T cells. So one of the ways we had tried to address that question was to take our different types of CAR Tregs and stimulate them with beads that were conjugated to just pure HLA-A2. So it's a very reductionist system here. And then look at what happens to the cells over a 12-day period. Um, this is just looking at fold expansion. The interesting thing we saw was actually the, the CD28 wild type 4 NBB and TNFR2 CARs were the only CARs that induced, ex induced expansion in this very reductionist, just single antigen um, uh, experiment. Um, but what was more surprising was when we went and looked at the phenotype of these cells that were expanding, the cells uh, expressing the 4NBB or the TNFR2 CAR, although they maintained FOXP3 expression, they seemed to very rapidly lose Helios expression, in particular with the TNFR2 containing CAR. So these cells were growing really well, but at the same time losing Helios expression. So we went in to uh, try and address whether or not at the epigenetic level, there was evidence for lack of Treg stability. And we did this by pyrosequencing in the TSDR locus, so a region of the FOXP3 promoter that's important for controlling high FOXP3 expression in Tregs. So at day zero, this is looking at the amount of methylation at the eight different CPGs that we measure using our pyrosequencing assay. So at day zero, all of the different CAR T regs, so they haven't been exposed to their antigen yet, are completely demethylated as we would expect for nice T regs, whereas the conventional cells up here are all essentially completely methylated. You can see the averages. And then if we come back 12 days later and we look at what happened to that amount of methylation, um, the, whereas the CD28 wild type CAR T regs essentially remain um, almost completely demethylated especially the cells expressing the TNFR2 CAR now have significantly acquired methylation. And then this is directly correlated. The amount of increase in methylation is directly correlated with the loss of Helios expression and not correlated at all with FOXP3, which is you know, obvious because they didn't lose any FOXP3 expression. So this was kind of surprising because it seemed to uncouple changes in methylation with changes in FOXP3 expression. So of course, we also had to look at the classical suppression assays uh, to see whether we could um, have predicted what was going to happen in the mouse model based on how well these cells functioned in vitro. So one of the challenges was we had to figure out a way to do the assay um, such that we could independently control activation of the responder T cells and the CAR T regs. So we could not have anti-CD3 antibodies present with the CAR Tregs, otherwise they would get activated through their T cell receptor and we wouldn't be looking at CAR specific effects. So it took Nick a really long time to work out this assay, but eventually he got it uh, to work. And so the end protocol was to separately activate the cells. So in one dish, activate the CAR Tregs with the HLA-A2 coded beads and in another well, stimulate the um, CD3 responder T cells with CD3-28 um, Dynabeads and then remove those beads 
um, put everybody together for three days and then look at the ability of these car stimulated t regs to suppress the proliferation of these CD3 positive cells. Uh, and we used total CD3 positive cells so we could read out both CD4 and CD8 suppression. So on the top, it's all the CD28 family members and on the bottom, all the TNF receptor family members. Uh, and it's a pretty complicated set of data, but uh, just to highlight, uh, always the CD28 wild type is the winner at the top. Um, but actually in this assay, all of our different cars did show an improved ability to suppress compared to the NGF control. So in green, those are just the polyclonal Tregs, which do have a certain amount of suppressive function. It's, uh, you know, these are activated Tregs. Um, they just have some background suppressive function. And so all the different cars, even the PD-1 car, which completely fails in all other assays, has a significantly um, increased ability to suppress compared to the NGF control. Uh, and I especially want to draw your attention to the TNFR2 and the 41BB cars, which are the ones that didn't work at all in vivo. They're actually pretty decent in vitro, so the it's a you know it's less suppression than the wild type, but um, I don't think we would have predicted based on these data that they wouldn't work at all in vivo. So um, these results in the classical T cell suppression assay didn't really seem to fit with what the results were in vivo. So we then decided to go look at a different mechanism of action, which is suppression of dendritic cell activation. So one of the many things Tregs can do is to actually downregulate expression of CD80 and CD86 on dendritic cells. So in these co-culture assays, we um, mixed our CAR Tregs with HLA-A2 positive dendritic cells and then looked at expression of these co-receptors and just uh, first point you to the controls. So this is uh, on the top CD86 and on the bottom CD80. So this is the amount of expression just from the dendritic cell by itself. And then if we co-culture them with the polyclonal Tregs, so just exp expression the NGF alone, we do see some suppression. Again, this is an allogeneic system. These are polyclonal Tregs, we would expect to see that. And then there's sort of a dose dependent increase in the amount of uh, suppression, well, I guess it's not dose dependent, it's CAR dependent increase in the amount of suppression of CD86 or CD80 expression with the CD28 wild type always being the most potent. But in this case, in contrast to the T cell suppression assay, we could see that this CAR, the TNFR2 CAR and the 41B B CAR, the ones that didn't work at all in vivo, also are not working in this assay. And similarly for PD1. So it seemed like the results of this assay were better predictive of what was going to happen in vivo in the mice. And when we tried to quantify that, we ended up um, using uh, the graft versus host disease score as the metric at day 28 to correlate with the results from the T cell suppression assay, either CD4 or CD8, finding that there's actually not a uh, correlation at all really between these two parameters. But there is a significant correlation when we compare the amount of suppression of uh, GVHD um, to the amount of CD80 suppression. And it's really like mostly illustrated if you look at the TNFR2 car here, where you can see there's a good correlation between poor CD80 suppression and poor ability to prevent graft versus host disease. Whereas over here, you have a reasonable ability to suppress T cells, but this poor ability to suppress graft versus host disease. Um, so we were also interested in knowing transcriptionally what these cars were doing to the Tregs. So this is just sort of a dump of all the, the data. I could look at this heat map forever because I think there's so many interesting things here. But just like in a big picture, um, I want to highlight a couple of different things. One is that the car containing uh, the PD-1 essentially looks almost identical to unstimulated Tregs. So the way Nick did this experiment was he took his car Tregs cultured them just with pure beads coated with HLA-A2 for 24 hours and then looked at RNA. So this really just illustrates that the PD-1 car is uh, a very good negative regulator of Treg activity. Uh, and then the other thing I wanna point out is uh, that the CD28 wild type car clusters together with the uh, Tregs that are stimulated through their T cell receptors. So just the normal way with anti-CD3, anti-CD28 beads. So it kind of highlights that the CD28 wild type car seems to be giving sort of the most uh, physiological signal, if you will, to the Tregs. And then all the other ones were sort of variations in the middle. 
uh, when we went to dive into these data in a bit more detail, really try and see what was going on. I'm just, there's a lot of uh, transcriptional data in the paper, which you can go look at, but I just pulled out some of the more interesting plots. So um, as I just mentioned, uh, when we look at the, the transcriptome data in a volcano plot, this plot is comparing the CD28 wild type car to the anti-CD3-28 uh, classically activated Tregs, and there's not that many differences. And so that just supports what I was saying, that essentially they're approximately equal. There's um, not a lot going on, suggesting that the CD28 wild type car is, is giving us a, a signal that's pretty similar to just TCR activated Tregs. And then uh, this plot on the right shows that um, the CAR Tregs are, are definitely uh, not at all similar to CAR T conventional cells. So if you just look here, also the, the log fold change is completely different on this graph compared to this graph. So it just shows you how different CD28 CAR T regs are from CD28 CAR conventional cells. And you can see lots of things you would expect, like the CAR conventional cells making tons more cytokine, and then the CAR T regs having expression of all of our favorite molecules like CTLA4, FOXP3, Tidget, et cetera. So trying to figure out what transcriptionally made a good CAR versus a bad CAR was a little bit more uh, challenging. And we were lucky to work with um, German, uh, I'm gonna pronounce his last name incorrectly, Novansky, who is a graduate student in our institute, who's a bioinformatician. And he helped Nick do um, more detailed bioinformatic analysis to compare transcriptional profiles of the poorest performing CARs um, against the best performing CD28 wild type car to try and really figure out what makes a good car Treg. And what consistently uh, they came up with is that the bad cars um, always seem to be enriched in um, interferon uh, hallmark pathways, and the good car always seem to be enriched in metabolic type pathways. Um, this is also seen here where we compared the transcription profiles of the cars that had uh, unstable helios, so the 4MDB and the TNFR2 versus the CD28 wild type. So again, we see the bad cars being enriched in these interferon pathways and the good cars having uh, enrichment in these more metabolic type pathways, mTOR signaling, cell cycle, glycolysis, that sort of thing. Uh, trying to figure out why the CD28 mutant CAR didn't work uh, was a bit more interesting because at the transcriptional level, essentially it was identical to the wild type CAR. We, we have these two genes here, but who knows if they're really significant. Otherwise, they were transcriptionally identical. Uh, however, if we look at the hallmark pathways, again, we saw that the, the CD28 mutant had this enrichment in the interferon pathways and the CD28 wild type had this enrichment in the various metabolic related pathways with fatty acids, oxidative phosphorylation, cell cycles. So suggesting that really what's important from the CD28 wild type car is that this car is required to get the cells into a good metabolic state that allows them to divide and proliferate and presumably survive in vivo. So the main conclusion from the paper is that there are many ways to arrive at a suboptimal car for Tregs. So we were you know, originally a bit disappointed that we didn't find something that was amazingly better than our first car, but um, you know, I think we still learned a lot about uh, Treg biology by doing this work. So one of the ways that you can arrive at a bad car is to have poor expression, for example, by not choosing the right transmembrane or there's other components that can also affect um, car expression. You can have poor Treg stability as we have evidence from work on the 4MBB and the TNFR2 car. You can have poor stimulation of different types of Treg mechanisms of action. So the multiple cars were not very good at stimulating optimal expression of LAP and GARP. And there's probably other suppressive mechanisms that would be similarly effective, but effective we just didn't look at. You can also have cars that uh, have poor suppression of dendritic cells. So the 4NBB, TNFR2, and PD1 cars were all not very good at suppressing DC activation. Um, you can have suboptimal metabolic activity as illustrated from the last bit of sequencing data with the CD28 mutant car. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of other papers that really um, emphasize or I guess confirm um, our findings. So two other studies that also looked 
at 41DB cars for Treg. So one paper that was published before ours from Marcella Mouse's lab in red here, they compared Tregs, human Tregs expressing a 41DB car versus a CD28 car. And you can see they basically got the same result that the 41BB car, and at least in their suppression assay, they were able to, to show that there was a quite significant decrease in the suppressive ability of these Tregs compared to the CD28 wild type. And more recently, a paper from the Yoshimura labs uh, showing that the 41BB car, as we had shown, is not very good at producing TGF beta. So this is a CD19 car which uh, is comparing, this is the CD28 versus the 4NBB, reading out TGF beta. So basically exactly as we saw, the 4NBB car is not able to produce as much TGF beta as the CD28 car. And they also saw some decrease in Helios and FOXP3 expression, although it was quite a minor effect. So I feel pretty confident that at least for the 4NBB car, we you know, got the right answer that this car is not best for human Tregs. Um, what did we learn about Treg biology? So we certainly learned that uh, what happens to Tregs in the Xenogvhd model is influenced by multiple factors. That I think there's an underappreciated role for dendritic cells in the suppressive function of Tregs because that turned out to be the in vitro assay that really could have predicted what happened in vivo. Um, it's really emphasized the importance of monitoring not only FOXP3 but also Helios. Uh, and that the methylation status of the TSDR is not always predictive of FOXP3 protein expression because we had very significant changes in TSDR and pretty much no effect on FOXP3 expression. Uh, the other thing we, we, I didn't, we didn't emphasize hugely in the paper, but it's quite interesting, is that PD-1 strongly suppresses CD3 zeta signaling in Tregs. So if you go and look, um, though that car has both PD-1 plus CD3 zeta, and if you compare it to CD3 zeta alone, the PD-1 is always less good than the CD3 zeta alone. And that's in contrast to CTLA-4, which seems to have little to no effect, which is quite interesting in terms of understanding the biology of these negative receptors in Tregs. Um, so we, of course, we have lots of outstanding questions and future things to do. There's lots of caveats to using the Xeno GBHD model because you're putting human cells into a mouse. So there's lots of caveats related to poor lympho, uh, lymphoid networks, poor homing, uh, not great APC reconstitution, et cetera. So one of the things we're doing now, and I'll show you a snapshot of data in a minute, is, is setting everything up to work in syngeneic mouse models. Um, of course, we only looked at a small fraction of the number of co-stimatory molecules you could imagine testing, so there's lots of other domains to test, uh, and we haven't yet tested any third-generation cars where we're combining different types of co-stimatory molecules. And this curious finding of Helios, so well, how is it that we managed to uncouple FOXP3 and Helios, and what exactly is Helios doing in human Tregs? Um, so just two slides on where we're going from here. So Isaac in the lab now has remade all of, or most of these cars uh, for working in the mouse context. Uh, this is just showing some of the data from, uh, that we have differences in expression. So here's our CD28 uh, wild type car, nice and expressed as usual. Um, but interestingly in the mouse system, we were not able to get expression of the CTLA-4 car or the TNF-R2 car. We tried a few different things but for some reason, uh, these receptors just don't express in mouse cells. We don't quite understand why. Um, it's interesting to note that CTLA-4 is uh, like identical between mouse and human, um, and nevertheless works in humans and doesn't work in mice, whereas the TNFR2 car is actually quite different between mouse and humans. So maybe there's something structurally different about the TNFR2 that makes it not well expressed in the mouse system. Um, but Isaac's gone on, uh, he's going to use this system um, to interrogate various questions uh, in the syngeneic mouse models, but just to show you um, some early data that if you express these cars in mouse Tregs and you look at the ability to stimulate proliferation, we get the identical to result to what we had seen in the human system, so the CD28 wild type car being the best, other cars having various degrees of, uh, of effect, and the PD-1 car down here always being one of the worst. Um, so I'm going to end there and hand it over to Olivia for questions. Thank you very much, Megan, for that uh, great presentation. And I want to congratulate you and your colleagues for such beautiful work. Um, let me ask you, give, give the group a minute to, I see questions coming in, but let me just start off. Um, 
with a question about the differences that you see in 41BB compared to, I guess, in the oncology field and and some of the uh, patterns in terms of the, the best CAR uh, signaling domains. Do, do you think that this um, determining the ideal combination has to do with the, the model system, the, the target antigen? Um, I mean, you mentioned cer certainly trafficking and survival and, uh, survival and all of these things, but do you think it's it's going to ultimately be necessary to sort of customize your CAR-T reg depending on the specific, uh, you know, the system, the transplant model versus, you know, oncology, tumor models, and so on? Dr. Levings and Dr. Martinez, this is Brian Valera with AST staff again. Dr. Levings, if you could go full screen again oh, for the okay. recording. All right, we appreciate sorry. it. Thank you so much. My apologies. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, uh, Nick, do you want to take a first stab at answering that? Yeah, sure. I can uh, take a quick stab at that. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting point regarding target antigen and, and dialing in, you know, the, what signaling domains you might want. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's something we hadn't really thought of before, but um, yeah, you bring up a good point that you know the kinetics of each you know signaling domain might might be different in you know the context of different target antigens you know if there's a different antigen density on the cell uh, or whatnot but um, yeah it's a really interesting point that we hadn't considered but i guess just to take that a step further um i had a question about whether the actual uh recognition domain the single the single chain um mm -hmm is a factor too in terms of the if you're targeting the same antigen and you substitute it in different signaling domains i mean i'm mean, not signaling domains recognition domains uh you know for example with a t-cell receptor you can tune signaling that way and i don't know if that applies in this case um well, yeah, certainly the the affinity of of the scfv is going to drive some of the you know the, the downstream signaling um, and you know that has an interaction with the avidity and the, and the target antigen density too so um, yeah if you're just swapping in different different recognition domains you could definitely probably see a difference um, yeah okay so let me let me uh, bring up some of the questions from the audience the first one five from Ruan Zhang asks, do you deplete endogenous TCR before introducing the CAR? Uh, I can answer that one. No. So we have, we at the time were not sophisticated enough to do that. So this is just overexpressing the CAR and the endogenous TCR will certainly be there. Um, there's debate going on now about whether that endogenous TCR might actually be helpful for Tregs um, in the in vivo environment because potentially they are getting some tonic signaling through their presumably self-reactive TCR. Um, so that's something we'll have to address experimentally. Now we have the tools to do that. Okay, um, here's a question about the specificity uh, from Raja Lingam Raja, who's asking, uh, pointing out that HLA-A2 shares high sequence homology with several other class one molecules such as A62, A69 and so on. Do A2 specific CAR T reg bind to these cross reactive antigens? Aha, you will have to read our 2019 JCI Insight paper. Nick, I'll hand that one over to you. Yeah, uh, we definitely addressed that in, in there. Um, we screened a whole panel of HLA alleles um, from these reagents that. Um, are available from one lambda. Um, the, the spoiler is that they strongly cross-react with A69, but not significantly with any of the other HLA A alleles that we tested. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Sam Zhang. How long do these Tregs live in vivo in mouse and humans? Um, and the second part to the question is, how long do the Treg provide protection from graft rejection? Uh, Nick, you want to do that one? Sure. Um, so it, Megan showed the data that um, you know they, in the CD28 wild type CAR T regs, we could still detect them in the Xenogvhd model 
uh, day seven, and we could also see them a little bit at day 14, but beyond that, we couldn't really see them. And, and there was they were never in uh, enough number that we could then pull them out to do assays with. Um, sorry, I forgot the second part of that question. Um, how long do they provide protection from graft rejection? Right. Um, so our, our Xeno DVHD model only went out to day 42. Um, you know, at the lower ratio, you could see uh, when we did one um, CAR T reg to four PBMCs, uh, you could see that you know the mouse the mice started to you know die uh, towards the end of that, and and you know even the ones that were surviving started to see some signs of GVHD. So um, they provided protection kind of up to that point, but probably not much farther than that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so just to follow up on that, the cells are not, I mean, the mice eventually are going to get Xeno GBHD. It's not a complete prevention model. Um, okay, another question from Ruan Zhang. Uh, how do you measure the signaling strength of the different CARs, such as, for example, PI3 kinase signaling or MAP kinase signaling? Uh, so I can take that one. So we haven't actually done any signaling um, experiments. We we did start off at some point trying to work on that and just had, I don't know, didn't get around to finishing it. But you would just do it the classical way that you would, would do phosphate flow following stimulation with your A2 antigen or Western blotting, depending on what you would look at. Um, so we didn't actually, I guess the limitation is that we didn't actually confirm that that CD28 Y to F mutate mutant actually had a decreased activity of the PI3 kinase pathway. Um, and we have not compared the different cars for signaling strength downstream to ERK or PI3 kinase or NF-kappa B or anything. But I guess the, like the RNA sequencing data suggests that that might be an interesting direction to go in because um, we saw, I didn't highlight it, but we saw quite a few differences in potential activity of the NF-kappa B pathway, which could be investigated further. Okay, that brings me to a question from Maria Luisa Alegre about NF-kappa B. Uh, she says, we had shown a while back that NF-kappa B signaling could antagonize Tregs. Do you think the worst performance of the TNFR family member cars is due to that? Yes. I. I think so. Uh, and Nick, I'll pass it over to you in a sec, but uh, I think when we did the transcription factor analysis, we saw a lot of enrichment in NF-kappa B family members and the poor performing cars. Is that right, Nick? Uh, you're, you're really testing my memory, but I, I think so. It <laughs> <Yes. laughs> was a while ago. <laughs> yeah. um, I was intrigued by the 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 Helios results and the link with stability and so on. I wonder if you could expand on that thought or how on that finding or what you're, if you're further uh, pursuing that. Okay. Isaac, do you want to take that one? Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here, of course. Yeah, Isaac did all the Helios uh, data, so I'm handing that one over to him. Okay. We actually, uh, we actually don't know exactly what is, what is the role of Helios in traits. You know, um, you know, but it's true also regarding the the different the differences between Fox P3 and Helios is that these cells are being stimulated. So it's know that uh, the conventional other cells can transit transitorily upregulate Fox P3. So maybe we cannot see difference of Fox P3 and the Fox P3 percentage is not correlated with DSDR doing that. Because uh, you know this is all preferred, and maybe that Fox P3 is not saying the same that the truly same T Rex. Mm -hmm. um, another question I was I was wondering. So so just more broadly, if you were going to try to um, you know apply what you've learned and and maybe try to create a more a super car. Um, CAR T with the knowledge about these signaling domains and, and is there a way you could tweak them or make hybrid domains, for example, or to try to boost cytokine production um, because it looked like the, the cytokine production wasn't tremendously high in terms of IL-10, for example. Um, is, the, is that an approach that you've thought about? 
Yeah, so in general, we there's all sorts of different ways you can try and further improve the cars. So of course, the IL, like focusing on the IL-10, we were disappointed to not get higher IL-10. Uh, it's actually very hard to get um, naive human T-regs to make IL-10. And so figuring out ways to overcome that barrier would definitely be a future direction. And um, I think one of the big outstanding questions in the field coming back to something else we were discussing before is how the affinity really affects the biology of the cells. So, um, so far everybody has just used whatever single chain they had in their hand to test cars and T-regs. But there's a lot of work coming from the cancer world suggesting that cars with lower affinities may actually be better. So that's something that we're, we're going to start pursuing as well to address that question. Okay, um, there was a question earlier from Raja Lingam Raja. Have you checked for anti-A2 antibodies? Uh, so, you mean, the, I'm not sure if the question means antibodies to the car itself or to HLA-A2. So, antibodies to the car itself, we have not checked because uh, the humanized mouse model would you wouldn't right. see them because it's got such a screwed up immune system. But in the fully syngeneic mouse context, we could do that, but we haven't yet. Um, if the question was about how the car affects um, anti-HLA2 antibodies, then you can have a look at our AJT paper where we, in 2020, uh, where we did address that question in the syngeneic mouse model. Okay. Um... Another question from Maria Luisa Alegre. Do you think the poor performance in vivo than in vitro for some of the cars is due to abnormal recruitment to the graft in vivo if the signals elicited by some of the cars don't elicit the right chemokine receptors? Right, so I guess um, in the Xeno GVHD model, it's hard to address that question because we don't actually have a graft. It's just sort of a systemic whole body effect. But uh, now that we're going into the mouse model, we can do proper graft transplants. That's something we can definitely address. We have not comprehensively looked at how the different cars affect expression of chemokine receptors. Okay. Uh, I guess, what is it, what do you think it is about CD28 that makes it so much superior to the others? Um, you know, beyond, it proliferates better. Um, do, do you think that, you know, impacts survival ultimately and those other features uh, biochemically in terms of the function of those cells? Or what is it that sets it apart so dramatically from the other yeah, I mean, it's still, we still don't have a definitive answer. I, I think it must come down to that, that receptor in Tregs being able to most effectively promote survival and metabolic health of the cells. Like if you look at the RNA sequencing data, all of the target pathways were metabolism related. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a hypothesis. And we, at the time, didn't get around to doing seahorse type assays, but uh, like I'm pretty sure that we would have seen a signal from the seahorse assays showing the benefit of the CD28 wild type version. Um, so I guess one one kind of curiosity is why ICOS didn't do the same because the signaling pathways downstream of ICOS are very similar to CD28. Um, so I don't know, something to look into for the future. So in terms of your mouse models um, that Isaac is working on in terms of creating the new versions of these molecules for the mouse studies, what, what key questions will then that lead you to be able to address that you think are uh, of most importance that you can then tra translate back to the human system? Yeah. Isaac, do you want to take a first stab at that? Yes, first of all, we want to, you know, to, to know exactly if we can see the same that we saw in human CAR T regs in you know immunocompetent models. That's the first things that we 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 want to confirm. And then we also are interested in, in confirm uh what I mean to run to, and to do RNA sequences to figure it out what's going on with these cells, interested in studying the, the interaction with these cells with the others. So when we have I think if when we have all this information in an immunocompetent model, we will have a better picture 
that give us the, the answer of the utility of, of these tools for, for improving the tolerance in human. I guess those other aspects of, of trafficking and in a graft environment in an immune uh, sufficient mouse and so on will come into play that will be informative yeah. in terms of survival of the CAR T regs as well and those other questions. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions from our audience. So um, I think we will, we're getting close to the top of the hour. I'm going to then just uh, thank Dr. Levings and her colleagues for joining us today to talk about this really interesting paper and their future plans for the work. Um, I want to thank everybody in the audience for participating and those of you who offered questions. I uh, want to thank AST and the Education Committee and, of course, Brian Valeria for coordinating this. Uh, thanks very much to all and have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Martinez. Thank you, everyone. AST would like to thank Dr. Levins, Dr. Martinez, Dr. Dawson, and Dr. Rosado Sanchez and all of our attendees for today's session. Please remember to complete the evaluation survey and visit myast.org slash journal club or the AST YouTube channel to view our video journal club archives and register for upcoming journal clubs. To learn more about the AST community of transplant scientists, please visit myast.org slash COPS or connect directly to the COP hubs. Thank you for today's session.